Augmenter in general as a company is specializing in augmented reality, which is tonight's topic, and also a little bit about virtual reality, two similar technologies that have different implementations, but there's a lot of commonality underneath the, uh, underneath the surface. So our backgrounds are, have been in the DOD space predominantly. Um, personally, my, my degrees are in physics, specializing in optics, and I spent 14, 15 years doing high altitude airborne surveillance systems. Alex uh, has a degree in computer science and uh, worked on a, a graduate certificate in systems engineering. And a lot of what we're seeing here is really the, the benefits of systems engineering, how you can integrate diverse sort of products and hardwares together uh, to, to help push things forward in a, a novel sort of fashion. So we see that there, there are a lot of possible market verticals or different applications in industry or in government that can use this sort of technology, particularly in the AR space, and that's, that's what we'll be focusing on tonight. So our emphasis, well, I guess let me back up. When, when you look at the AR space as a whole, there are four different main sort of areas where, where there are activities possible or benefits that can be realized. And if you look on the, the, the two on the right, which is kind of a, a hands-free operation for production, for doing uh, workflow or improving assembly processes, things like that, uh, is kind of one common use. Another one is for remote interaction or field support, where you've got your highly trained engineer, kind of works, works out of the, the office hub, and a series of technician types may go out to the field to support different sorts of installations, be they border cameras or expensive machines or whatever. Then they can actually talk back, if you will, to the subject matter expert back at the plant using essentially a telepresence, where the, the person can provide some augmented guidance of no, cut the blue wire, or you know, the, something bad will happen. <laughs> Um, so, so there's a lot of activity in that space, and if you read a lot of the, the trade journals, you'll see uh, a number of different startups that have gotten funding or, or advancing products in that space. So when Alex and I came along, uh, we said, you know, that's cool, that's interesting, we can certainly do that, we can consult in that area, and we can, we can assist in that area, but our particular personal strengths is in the area of highly integrated video systems of precision timing of larger systems integration sort of work, visualizing 3D data as an example, which we'll be showing you an example here later tonight. So that's really what we've been focusing on. Um, all of our products sh kind of share that as a core competency and a core capability. Uh, Alex has developed a geo-registration capability that's embedded inside this Microsoft HoloLens, and there'll be a demo uh, in a little bit on that. And with that, we've really been kind of pushing the limits of what you can do with an untethered AR kind of out in the real world, where um, you know this, this particular device and some of the other devices are designed to work in an indoor application, lots of vertical walls, I get lots of nice uh, registration capabilities. Well, with the software that's in here, we can actually go walk out in the parking lot, and we can tell you more or less where you are in terms of latitude, longitude, and altitude, and that allows us to access a totally different sort of data sets than you could do just with a indoor camera-based sort of registration. We've also, like I mentioned uh, in the beginning, and this is really gonna be kind of the end of, end of what I say about it, uh, have, have taken kind of the same approach in terms of some cutting edge VR capabilities. Uh, one of them, if you see the, the, the yellow looking thing on the right, is actually a test chamber for the US Air Force where they're looking at integrating 100 plus sort of cameras and delivering that real time into a, a virtual reality space. So we've actually written a proposal for that. Uh, we're waiting to hear on that, but that ties in again to the systems integration, the precision timing of video, the precision alignment, things of that nature. Okay, so I've said augmented reality, I've said virtual reality, and as Alex mentioned earlier, that means a lot to us. It might not mean, mean quite the same to everybody, so I'll just do a, a quick sort of definition. AR, which is kind of the way I refer to it, allows the digital insertion of a live virtual image, pretend image, that the operator can see overlaid across the real world, so that I would actually be looking at the room, I'd be seeing everybody, but there'd be a dinosaur or whatever floating right there, and to me, as the wearer with a headset on, 
That is a perfectly legitimate and real sort of object, but it's, it's invisible to the rest of the room. Now, the real advantage is that allows you to move around. It allows you to, to you know, build your turbine or do whatever you're doing and still experience the world around you. VR, which uh, you see the headset there on the right, the, the gentleman on the bottom right corner, is a fully immersive sort of experience where you've got the, the computer screens and the displays are inside an opaque headset that creates a virtual world. It, it might be a representation of the room around you or it might be the surface of the moon. It doesn't really matter. Wherever the experience designer wants to place the wearer, they're immersed in this environment. And you know, from a computer processing standpoint, that's more limiting. You usually need a, a fairly high-end computer to deal with that. You're tethered to some sort of uh, off-board graphics processor. You may need to have some sort of external sensing device to know where you are in that virtual space where the AR devices don't, don't have that sort of limitation. Now, there is a tremendous amount of activity going on in the, in the hardware space particularly in the area of AR right now. It's, it's, it's blossoming, it's growing crazy. We'll talk about some of those and actually some of the things that we talked about less than a year ago are already extinct and uh, projects have been shut down. So there, there is a lot of churn in this space and it's, it's quite interesting. Okay. What yeah. is Department of Defense. See, there you go, stuff that, <laughs> stuff that we, we toss out. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's been kind of our background. Uh, I was working at some of the large government contractors and. So we've supported the, the different branches of the government. So there are multiple implementations for AR. I'm sure probably everybody in the room or almost everybody except for my firstborn who really wants one <laughs> has their own uh, smartphone. And, and with those, uh, you know, there was the big craze about a year ago or so, a year and a half ago for Pokemon Go. That's when kind of the broad populace said, hey, look, it's, it's AR. There's a little creature right there. This is so cool. So, so that is one implementation, and there is a lot of work in that space. There's a lot of reasonable commercial applications for marketing purposes or how big is this couch that you're looking at in Ikea or whatever. Um, and so, so you'll see a lot of discussion about that just kind of in the general market space. As you start moving up in terms of the performance capability, yes, you're moving up in terms of price, but you get, you get more for your money. You've got some fairly simplistic display glasses, which is a headset, but it doesn't do the precision registration. Once you start having a tethered headset, something like the Meta 2, you've got a, a very strong capability, but you're, you're uh, you know, plugged into the computer over here, but it's got a nice wide field of view and a lot of capability at your fingertips because that, that computer, the host computer, is still doing the video processing. But really kind of the holy grail, the thing that we've put the big gold star on that everybody's waiting for and, and, and still waiting for is the true untethered AR headset. Uh, the Microsoft HoloLens today is the most capable of those that, that we're aware of. Uh, there, there continue to be uh, lots of press releases about Magic Leap um, and some of the other uh, products that are coming online, but their capability hasn't really been proven yet. So. Touching on the mobile device AR for just a minute, I mentioned po Pokemon Go. It's a fairly simplistic application. You kind of take a video feed from your camera and you smash a little critter out there. And it's not particularly registered. It doesn't do a lot of environmental sensing. Uh, it's, it's a fairly simplistic form of programming. They recently did a release using AR Kit and most likely AR Core, I suspect, uh, to, to take use of some of the co-processing capability that's, that's being rolled out into some of the higher end phones. And, and mentioning AR Kit uh, came out last fall. Apple, you know, you, you can't get out of the way of Apple. They're everywhere. There's 200 million of these things. And um, with the AR Kit capability, it can do a basic scan of the environment and find level surfaces. It could find that table right there as an example. And with that, you can do a much better registration than the you know, Gen 1 Pokemon Go where there's this thing. Oh, there's now an object. My thing should be here. Yes, sir? That means that you recognize where something is in, in space, and then you tie your digital object to that. So as I would walk around, you know, if I were the phone, I would say, hey, this is, this is that same surface, so I'm going to keep my digital object here. 
as I move around because I have registered that, that location in space. So if you're looking at your phone, you know, your little, little creature or whatever it is, you will stay there. You know, it's not just like it's, it's like you know, on your screen. It's, it's, it knows where it is in space. So it makes it seem convincing to you. Otherwise, it's like, well, no, I put it, you know, I put it on the, ta on the, on the chair, and I look over here, and now it's some other place. Right. So, so you can stick where you want it to stick. An, an unregistered uh, example would be, okay, that table is six feet in front of me, okay? Well, if I move over here, so it's nine feet in front of me, a registered image is still going to be on the table. Instead of floating off in space, six feet in front of me, you know, not tied to the, the, the physical location. And, and you know, there's, there's a lot of processing capability in today's, you know, tablets and mobile phones and things like that. And, and they can do uh, calculations of that nature fairly, fairly, in a fairly straightforward fashion. Um, when we talked and, and gave this presentation back in August, you know, Google had this Tango platform. Uh, was kind of their version of AR, and the the Tango system was basically tied to one particular type of camera that was being installed in different phones. So if you had a Tango capable phone, good for you. Well, not everybody did, and of course, you know, you spend money for a phone, you want it to work for you know four or five years or whatever to to get your money out of it, and so that kind of wasn't the best business model. So they actually shut it down. It concluded just last month in March of 2018. They announced this about six months ago, but um, it just shut down in March and has been replaced by a new program called AR Core, which is more generic, um, but kind of one of the challenges when you work with Androids is it is essentially an open ecosystem in terms of the hardware combinations, where Apple is a closed ecosystem. Apple knows exactly what they've made. They know everything about it. Yeah, you got a Samsung. Oh, I got a, you know, I got a X, Y, Z, uh, and it's an Android device. So that, you know, it, it's it's lagging behind uh, kind of the the AR kit because of that uh, ecosystem openness. So um, we we've updated this from the last presentation. There there are a large number of wearable devices that are available on the market today. Uh, and this is kind of a, a, a comparison. I mean, Alex and I are both kind of picky. Um, and, and I'll kind of briefly go over the, uh, the color code. It's, it's, the grays are just kind of like you'd see in your check register, you know, a dark line, a white line, so that you can kind of break them apart. So, so don't pay any attention to the grays. Something that is red, you know, to us is just too limiting for a practical sort of real world application like we're trying to do. That does not mean at all that it's not very valuable in something like an enterprise setting uh, for a person on an assembly line or doing quality inspections or things like that. Things like, you know, the Google Glass with, with one eye. There are certain things and applications that that is perfectly valid. And the price point is right. That's great. With our focus of trying to do some open world, uh, you know, immersive sort of AR, that didn't really fit our standards, was, was hence, in, in this particular example, why it got, got a, uh, a red grade. Um, the yellow is kind of middle of the road. Uh, in some cases, you know, here's a hollow lens, you know, it's on top line. It's a little heavy. We'd like it to be lighter than that. You don't want to wear it all day long at 20 ounces. Um, you know, you got some issues with battery life when things are self-contained versus a, a side pack where you can change the battery, things like that. Uh, and also price, kind of the $1,000 to $1,500 is kind of the, the magic price point. You want something like this to be just beyond like an Apple, you know, top-end Apple phone or, or whatever. Um, and a lot of them are not there yet. But, you know, many of these devices have some good capabilities. We're particularly partial to the HoloLens because of the quality of the experience it gives the wearer in terms of very precise registered holograms, and, and we'll show you some of those here in a few minutes. Um, so, so we like that. Uh, there is what they're calling Gen 3. Microsoft actually skipped Gen 2. They were going to release a second generation of this, but we're happy enough with the, the developer version that they passed over that. They're working on Gen 3 right now. It's supposed to come out sometime later this year to early 2019 is what we're hearing. One of the big things is that the rumor mill says it's going to have almost double the field of view, if not a little better. That's going to be, you know, that's really the drawback of this, is its field of view is fairly limited. And if they can double that, that'll be a substantial experience improvement. Um, 
But in terms of the time of flight sensors, the gyro, things like that, as long as that baseline carries forward, it's going to be a very solid unit. Uh, Magic Leap, there's been a lot of hubbub in the space about Magic Leap. It's a $2.3 billion startup that nobody knows exactly what they do. And they won't talk to you unless you have an NDA and, 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 and. Um, they claim they've started to ship some units. You know? Oh, okay. So, so there you go. They have units. So that's good. Oh, that's right. You had to buy a safe and put it away. Um, you know, the development environment is, is very favorable. Uh, it kind of needs to be out in, in the community, out in the wild, if you will, to get some real feedback for how good are the cameras, how good is the registration. You know, we've played with, with some of the other brands of equipment, uh, one of which is, is actually not on here. It's been since retired. Uh, but we tried it less than a year ago. You wear this nice, beautiful $10,000 plus headset, and it's going to be awesome. And everything's janky and moves around. And, you know, that sort of experience, forget the price point, that just, it, it's unnerving as a human, right? You'll get seasick wearing the thing, and, and you don't want that. So um, a lot of good information here. Happy to bring this back up if people want to look at it for uh, comparisons later or whatever, but uh, trying to move on here. The HoloLens, like I mentioned, is, is really our, our unit of choice at the moment. It's kind of the, the first and most widely available freestanding AR headset on the market at this point. It's being shipped now for two years. Uh, started to developers only, of course. You can now buy it commercially. It's a little more expensive. This is, a, this is one of the developer editions here. It's got a mobile-grade processor and some onboard graphics, some really fancy uh, displays capabilities. But the beautiful thing is it is entirely self-contained. We've got it set up here as a spectator rig, so we can actually show you some videos up on the screen here in a little bit. But normally, you just put it on your head and off you go. You don't have to do anything until it's time to recharge your battery. And all we're doing with that thing is plug it in so the battery just run down. That's all right. we're plugging in is the power. And uh, so, so, yeah, so you'll see more about that. Magic Leap, I already mentioned them. They've got a ton of money. I don't know how they did it. Um, <laughs> I'm really curious to see where that goes. It has, uh, you know, I've got to believe it's got a lot of potential. So we'll, we'll see how that all comes together when it comes out. Uh, one of the interesting things that came to light last week is actually an open source AR headset. Uh, and it's by Leap Motion, they're calling it Project North Star. They're kind of teasing the, un the unveiling here. Uh, we're excited about it. We may, we may well build one for, for an application. But, and this is the big asterisk, is it's not a complete system. Yeah, they want you to use their hand tracking software and this and that and the other, but you still got to bring it all together. You still got to decide what your application is. You got to ruggedize it. You got to get its optics fab and things like that. And that doesn't necessarily scare us, but it might just live in a, in a fancy display on the desk and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Um, but it's really interesting to think about them actually open sourcing some of this. I mean, that's kind of the, the new way of things. There's a lot of, uh, you know, sharing forums, of course, for some of the AR algorithms and things like this. So it'd be interesting to see where this really goes. And uh, as we labeled over here, and this is straight off their release, right? Oh, great, let's go have some, you know, uh, electrical coatings that we can make it nice and dim when you go outside and things like that. That's really awesome, but that's also really hard particularly at a systems engineering level when you start putting it all together. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. Um, it's a big space, though. There is a tremendous amount of investment going on in this area just as a technology as a whole, fundamentally because between batteries becoming very capable and processors getting nice and small and efficient, you can kind of put those things together and do a lot in a small package. There's been a tremendous amount of money by a number of big players put into this space. I mean, you know, $2 billion plus. Microsoft has about $2 billion into this from what we've heard. You know, uh, Magic Leap, you know, $2.3 billion was the last count. It's coming. It's just too big not to get here sooner or later. The real question and, and the title of the pitch is, are we there yet? Um, it's very new, is, is our opinion. Uh, you can see on, on the uh, hype cycle here, we're right kind of at that trough of disillusionment, kind of starting to climb out. Vanna will go up here and point it out. Yeah, so 
I'm going to realize right here. Yep. So this is the, you know, right here, this is the uh, smart workspace or the 4D printing. I'm not sure what 4D printing is, but it's, it's all the way down here on the, it's just yeah, it hasn't happened yet. This is where everyone gets hyped up and says, oh, it's going to happen. Then you realize, oh, it's not there yet. And then once you get down what they call the trough of disillusionment, <laughs> then you start climbing back up to the, oh, we can actually really do something with it now. And so AR is just climbing out of this. You know, you all remember Google Glass from a few years ago, where Google Glass is going to revolutionize everything. Never realized, like, oh, this is kind of weird and small, and no one's really happy with it. So then everyone, oh, AR is dead. But no, we're climbing back out. That's, we're actually making a useful product and with AR now. Right. And, and, and the interesting thing to note is the dot next to it, farther, you know, climbing out into the, into the world of enlightenment, is actual virtual reality. Uh, from a hardware standpoint and from a ecosystem standpoint, VR is about five years ahead of AR. Um, as evidenced, I mean, to us being, you know, the former government contractor guys, is looking at the solicitations we see from the government. You know, why are they, why are they finally saying, look, I can actually you know, do this 3D visualization in VR. It's becoming a useful tool. There's a lot of training tools, a lot of things like that that are being driven there. And it won't be too long until AR is behind it. Um, we did attend, and I'm not trying to have this be a big government sort of pitch, but uh, we did attend an industry day earlier this year. And augmented reality is, in one, of the, is one of the top three technology research areas for the Army. There, there's a lot of effort uh, going into that space, but it, it still has a little ways to go. Um, but as it, as this really comes to life, you know, the market is much, much larger for AR, four times, five times larger. It's much more practical because you're not isolated. It's, um, an open sort of experience, but that really does have some social challenges. Um, and I'll let Alex take over from here. How's that? Yeah. I will socially uh, remove my talky thing. If I can find it. Did I get it right? There we go. All this is on tape. Hi. <laughs> Wardrobe malfunction. Have fun. Okay, back pocket. Back pocket. Check. What happens when you have people who don't have back pockets? Uh, belt. Belt. What if they don't wear, I mean, what if they're wearing like, you know, like sweatpants or something? Um, it could get interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, up through the shirt. Pardon me. That's right. There you go. <laughs> little, 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 please wait, technical malfunction sort of thing going on. <laughs> Check. We're good? I don't know yet. Good? Are you going to stand there? No, I'm going to stand back over here. All right. Hold on, let me get a focus. Focus, focus, focus. All right, so um, we're talking about you know AR and wearable AR. You know, you guys can see the size of this. You can come look at it later, but it's kind of a bulky thing. And one thing that happened with Google Glass is everyone was uh, was putting these on their head, and they all started worrying about what they were uh, calling glass holes, who were basically going to walk around and tape everybody all the time. So I mean, that was kind of the first you know real sort of uh, you know implication of. People don't really like you filming them usually. You know, if you were walking around with a camera in just public and just filming people like this, everyone would get kind of weirded out by that for probably really good reasons. So there's a whole sort of um, social acceptance to some of these AR headsets. You're wearing a computer on your head. You're, you, people don't know what they're doing, and it's it's you know it's 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 not quite there yet. Um, companies, you know, a lot of companies will basically say you know you can't take your camera in. Or they try to say that, even though everyone is carrying a camera in their pocket, you know. But they'll tell you that you can't have a camera um, in uh, in the workspace. And AR wearables are going to have the same sort of problems that uh, uh, mobile phones have. You know, everyone's you know brings their mobile mobile phones into work and plugs them into their you know their computers and uses their phones for email. It's a uh, companies can get kind of weirded out about the information they're passing around. You know, where Leif and I came from, uh, the big defense companies are really really terrified about that for obvious reasons about people trying to steal all the things, but any company is going to have a problem. If they have really proprietary information, information on your head walking around. And so the question is, is how do you uh, 
how do you use these things in, in, in the workspace? And, and quite frankly, beyond that, this thing's still really bulky. How do you put it on your head and, and, and use it without looking like a total idiot? You know, walking around in public, you know, people, you, people with Bluetooth headsets, you'll see them walking around, you know, the airport or what have you, just wandering and waving their arms around. It's going to get nothing but worse because now people are going to be able to have, you know, goggles on their head and, you know, be chasing Pokemon around the airport and you will have no idea what they're doing. So that's kind of a, a social challenge and that we'll, we all are going to have to experience as we go forward because it's, it's really kind of a new thing. So um, when you're writing software for it, there is a huge amount of stuff that has to be considered because there's a lot of, these things are very different from when you're using a, a computer or a phone or anything like that. It's a very different sort of way to, to use it because you're not looking at a screen, you don't have a keyboard, you don't have to, um, you, you don't have to, you're not sitting at a desk. You've got to basically constantly think about the new ways for people to really experience and use their devices and interact with the software that you've written with the environment. If you could do it on a computer, that'd be, that's one thing, but if you're, you know, if I had a, a, a hologram on the table and I was kind of like, you know, doing this in real life and you guys are all looking at me like I'm crazy because I'm just, you know, just kind of moving around like here. How do you use that and how do you bring that experience out? How do you interact with people who don't, aren't wearing the headsets? A whole bunch of system considerations for the interaction that you have when you're developing the software. And that doesn't even get into the fact that the hardware itself, you know, it's, it's very different. It's not like a little screen. You've got, uh, you've got, you've got to be able to see through it. You've got to see how well it's tracking. How do you interface with it? You don't have a keyboard, you don't have a mouse, you've got, but you've got speech, you've got your hand movement. What do you do with it? So all kinds of things to consider as you go forward, you know, working to, uh, you know, with AR. What we have down here is the, uh, the different devices that were supposed to come out this year or were coming out. We made this chart last year and we've already marked one of them as late. This, this ODG glasses, which look really nice on paper, were supposed to come out in you know, third quarter or fourth quarter 2018 and there's n nowhere in sight. Um, the, this giant headset, which I was, you know, looks like it makes you look like a stormtrooper or someone out of space balls is what I was thinking. They announced it cost $15,000 $15, and everyone went, well, I'm not paying that. So it just died right there. And so there's, there's all these people who have been you know, providing these new types of hardware, but it's really hard to make good hardware in this space. So it's, you know, to certain extent, it's been lagging a little bit what the, what the optimistic pro, um, projections of these companies are um, because it's really, really hard. It's kind of a whole level, new level of, of development and hardware needed to make a good experience. And so the skills. So, you know, there's a lot of things that when you're developing for AR and VR, you know, AR and VR can be very, very similar in these regards. Um, the first major thing is that it's, when you're writing software for these, you're, if you want to do a, a, what I would call a in, really interesting application where you're actually using a, a spatial orientation of the thing in the workspace, in, in, in the area, you're, you're inherently already in 3D. So you pretty much got to use a 3D engine, or a th which is basically a 3D game engine, because that's pretty much what people have. You can't take a, a 2D JavaScript program, no offense to anyone who, who writes JavaScript, but you can't take a 2D JavaScript program and slap a couple buttons on there and have anything that's a really interesting, usable AR application, because you're kind of missing that whole third dimension and, and the moving around in space. So you've got to basically learn how to use a 3D graphics engine. Uh, to program that, you've got to use you know, C Sharp if you're using Unity, which is one of the major engines that's out there, or C++ if you're using the Unreal Engine. If you want to make, uh, make assets for it, you've got to use you know, 3D, uh, 3D graphics programs like Blender, Maya, 3D, 3D Studio Max, something which lets you make a 3D model in space. You know, I'm a, I am a terrible artist, you know, I, but I can still draw stuff in, in uh, you know, you know, paint.net and look at me, and I, I can draw a picture and I can put that in 2D application. I tried making a 3D model and it was terrible. It was the word, you know, it's, it didn't match what I was trying to do and I really, it's a whole new level of, you know, complication to do that. You've got to learn how to program your device, your, uh, your, uh, your, your software, you know, the shaders to look good. You've got to learn how to light your, your scenes so that your items look like they naturally fit in your scene. And then on top of all that, you've got to make sure this thing runs properly because you don't have a, a giant computer up behind you with an untethered headset. You've got a, you know, in this case, a, a, a top of the line mobile process from 2014. You know, it's, it's not, it's like a one gigahertz processor. It doesn't do very much. 
So you've got to make sure your, your performance is good because if you don't get your performance right, it can honestly make you sick. Because what will happen is if you're looking around and you're trying to look at a, a scene in VR and you move your head this way and it doesn't move or kind of lags behind it. And this is, this is more prevalent in VR than it is in AR. But if you're seeing and your whole experience lags, your mind will tell you that you've been poisoned and start making you go, okay, you better, better start throwing up now. Because that's, that's what the brain's response is. If it cannot match your visual, your visual cues to your, uh, to your ear cues. So it's you know, not just a, oh no, my software's slow. You know, your software's slow and it could make some of your, your users throw up, which is probably not a good impression to have on them. Now the nice thing is, is that after you've gotten all this stuff figured out, it applies pretty much to the entire range of uh, devices. You know, there's, you know, the Unity, the Unity for example, can, can target VR headsets, the Google Cardboard, HoloLens, everything, just with one common platform. And so your skills are very transferable between those different devices. Um, but it's a very different sort of skill set than what's historically been, uh, been used. The, uh, the user interference, or user experience. Um, what you see, on, like Pokemon Go, you know, the mobile experience which you'll see is you have a video, you're holding your phone up, and you're moving there, and you'll have a video scene, you, you can still poke at it. It's, it's still a very kind of conventional interface. You've got video, but you have your 2D sort of buttons and widgets and all the things in front of it. When you go to an untethered headset, you don't have, it doesn't work anymore. You can't, you know, put things in front of you that are locked to your head because it, you know, what Microsoft research has shown is that you will get people sick because you move your head, you expect things to move with it. So you expect to have your user interface kind of in, in space, not necessarily in a flat plane, but you've got to have it around the world and around the thing you're trying to interact with. So you've got to really kind of figure out what you're, well, how you're going to interact with things in a spatial sense, while at the same time realizing you don't have a keyboard or a mouse. So you've got to start using things like speech. You've got to think, use things like where the guy is looking. You've got to use you know, hand gestures, things like that to determine. So the guy can, or the, you know, the, the operator using it, so the user can interact with their environment in a much more natural sense than they ever could with, with the computer. So everything you've got has got to kind of consider that 3D space and how you, how you deal with that. Um, uh, one thing we did, so this is a kind of recent thing that, that we've been working on, is uh, we took a bunch of data from the U.S. Geological Service, some elevation data, some altitude heights. We took some, uh, some streets and the like from uh, OpenStreetMap, where you can you know, see the things, and we put them together. And we went down to, uh, to Auburn, drove down to... Uh, uh, Ashford Park, mainly because I knew it, been there before with my kids, and we had some nice altitude data. And uh, go ahead. it's right here. Yeah, so this is what it looks like when, we, when we're looking down the, on the table. So we look at this is what we see when we're in the hollow lens. So this is our, our office. We made a nice little elevation map. And so this is a, a small scale version of uh, Ashford Park. You can see the heights, you can see all the, uh, the power poles, you can see the uh, one, uh, Highway 80 going by there. And, uh, and we just placed it on the table and walked around it. So, so talk about the elevation data versus the vector. Yeah, and so, uh, so what you'll see, let me go back a little bit. There's two pieces of data here. That, ground, that gray in the background is the actual heights. Um, you know, the USGS actually makes available on the internet really detailed elevation maps for the entire country. So we took that data, we took the, uh, uh, the, the data from OpenStreetMap, and we, on the fly, put, ran that in the HoloLens such that you could easily walk around and, uh, and see what was going on up on the table. Then we went to the park, and we ran the software with our, with our geo registration items, and uh, we were able to basically line up all this altitude data with all the poles and streets and things like that. So this is... You are wearing this headset right now. And so this is what Leif was seeing outside his headset. He could see how all the hills were going. He could see where the, the, uh, the park label was, where all the power poles. Well, so, um, so what this system does, so what the HoloLens does, is it, as you're moving around, it will store a constant spatial map about where you are. So as I, you know, at this point, it's got this entire area all, all mapped. I can walk around the entire office and it goes, I know where you are. So if I put down a, a dinosaur right here, I can always come back and look and see the dinosaur 
hanging out in, uh, you know, in the room here. What we, did, we went down to Asher Park, what, what, what this device does not have is it doesn't have a GPS. And I was like, oh my gosh, why doesn't it have a GPS? Yeah. And the reason why is because a GPS is not accurate enough for any sort of position like this. GPS is, you know, the phones, you know, honestly, you pull your phone up and it gives you a little map, a little, little blinking dot, it's lying to you. You know, it's using a bunch of different things, but the actual GPS is, you know, meters, three, four meters or something like that. And if you, you know, normally that's fine. You know, okay, you're going to go drive in your car, drive on the road, tells you where it is. But when you're doing something like this, where you're actually looking at it, four meters is going to go, well, if I'm, you know, it's like, oh, wait, you're over there. You know, that's, that's not going to help anybody when it comes to uh, the positioning of the system. So what we did is we tied in the spatial mapping of this with the, the, you know, the USGS and other data to allow a really kind of real-time calibrated view of where you are. So we're relying on the HoloLens for some things and we're relying on our, on our previously done data for other ones. Um, I'll show you a demo of this one pretty soon. Um, well, the other thing we do is because this is a whole mobile device with connection to the internet, we did a whole sort of uh, software where we're showing real-time airplanes. I'll just show you the video because it's kind of more interesting. Um, so this is walking around out in uh, the little area over there. This is uh, Vegas. And as we're walking around, we put this map in place and we're seeing all the airplanes flying around, flying around Vegas. So we can look at, so this is all the traffic. We have the altitude maps and the, and the terrain. And we can click on an airplane. And it'll tell us exactly, you know, it gives a picture of what the airplane is. It'll, we're pulling that from another source on the internet. So this is the actual, you know, when we took this, the live position of the aircraft over where it actually is in space. So you can really see where, uh, where the traffic is. Vegas is a good example because they have these, all these, uh, these helicopter tours which like go flying down Vegas. So you can sit there and you see these little helicopters all following a nice little path right down the strip. This whole model was created by one of our partners. Uh, what they did is they basically flew an aircraft, uh, got a whole uh, uh, laser ranging map of the area, a whole very detailed elevation map, and they classified and drew all these different buildings. And then we took it all and imported it all into, and are on the fly generating this entire airport map, all of the, the geometry and bringing in the airplanes live. So as I move this thing around, you can see, you know, this is where the airplanes are coming in. This is the, the airport. And what our customer is looking to do is basically be able to manage a, a airport and basically understand where all of their all their vehicles are on the airport. There's like how many I mean there are how many vehicles on the airport today and uh, what are they saying? There's you know thousands and thousands of vehicles. They want to know where they are. So if you can basically have you know two different views one guy is sitting there looking at his airport on a blank table, but he can see all this stuff, as well as the guy who's actually on the airport, you know, kind of in a one-to-one -one view, able to find things on the airport. What we're getting is we're getting the, the, uh, the tr there's a, what they call a, an ADSB, ADSB transponder from aircraft, where they're always broadcasting their position, and this is when they're getting updates on this. We actually looked earlier today to realize that the coverage around this airport was actually terrifyingly low. So you're seeing, you know, the, what we're, the public data that we're pulling is, is uh, it's got a little bit of jumps in it. So we're gonna talk to our friends and have them put a receiver down there to get, to get better data on there. But that's what you'll see, yeah, you're seeing the aircraft kind of come in and they're jumping because the, the, we're not getting the, the, uh, the hit rates at the level that we need to. But that's live ABS. Well, yeah, so it's so a good example. So these, the guys that we're talking to, they do airport management. There are many, many lights at an airport. And the lights break a lot, you know, because they're lights, so they, they get damaged. And so when you say, hey, go fix that light, how do you know which light you're going to, which one that is again? And so you put this thing on, you go, you drive out there in your truck, and it'll tell you it's that light right there. You aren't trying to do this look at the map, look up, down, look, you know, you're not doing that. You've got the information right in front of you, right in front of your face. Yeah, the fact you've got this information in 3D, and this is one thing that Leif and I, you know, we, we, it, there's lots of ideas, you know, it's like, and we always come up with ideas, you know, when is a 3D view of things better than a 2D view? Because quite frankly, 2D views are pretty simple. Everyone kind of knows, you know, it's like everyone knows how to do a map. But in a place like this, we've got airplanes, 3D becomes really, really useful because then all of a sudden you can just visualize, like in that other video, you know, Bert was seeing it himself. He's seen all the airplanes, the high ones, the low ones. You don't have to, like, look at the number, or look at the flight level, then go, oh, wait, he's below that guy. You can just see it. It really becomes an advantage to, for visualization. 
and, and quite frankly, one of the barriers to entry, the, the primary barrier entry when it comes to that sort of stuff is, do you have all your, all your information already you know, in an electronic format? You know, so, you know, if you've got it all on paper, well, yeah, yeah I'm going to put an AR, but I, I don't even have a computer. It's going to take a little while for me to get it into AR or anything that I can do. So there's a whole bunch of steps that have to be done. You know, I think someone, it was a uh, uh, Lockheed who makes a C-130. Yeah. No, please. Don't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Lockheed makes a C-130, and someone said, oh, man, we can use AR to help build your C-130s. And I think some engineer says, like, do you know how much paper we have in this thing? It costs more money to build a new, design a new airplane than it would to take everything we have in paper and put it into the computer. So uh, why don't you come back in about 20 years? Sort of stuff like that. It's, it depends on the industry, you know, how, how electronic there is already. Or tribal knowledge. Or tribal knowledge. If you, don't, if, you, if you don't have this stuff documented at all, it's all just in a couple of guys' head, well, AR ain't going to help you there. Some of them are basically Android phones w with a web browser, and wh wh where things were black, it's clear. You, know, you, you can see it through it. So you can just basically fire it up you know, in a web browser, and whatever you can display on an Android thing, you can put it in front of your face. Um, there are a lot of the, what I probably call the 2D ones, I think are going to kind of a web, you know, web browser based sort of thing. So anything in a web page can be displayed in front of you. It's, um, it's, it's pretty flexible in that for, from, from, a, from a 2D overlay perspective. And it's all just kind of scaling and sizing and making sure it doesn't get in the way of what, what, what you're looking at. Yeah, so, so if you use, so Unity these days, that's a 3D engine, what it has built into it is they've got the uh, Vuforia, uh, marker tracking built into it. So you basically can print out a little target and it will locate that in the 3D scene. It knows the size so it can accurately place that thing. Um, I haven't done any testing to figure out exactly kind of how, you know, what, what exactly is that, that, that accuracy that's in there and how accurate, you know, this thing will operate by itself natively. This is a little laggy and our, our, my camera calibration is not as perfect as, as I'd want it to be. But when you're using the thing, you can kind of see how well it tracks. And um, I think it's really, Depends on what you're trying to do, and that kind of rolls back in the specs. So they're developing or have developed lidar on a chip. Yeah. So that could be applied to this. It's or it's a very similar technology. So what's what's in this specific hall lens is um, I think it's a, it's a structured light sensor. It's, it's basically what it's doing. It's got a, a series of dots, which it's outputting, and then it's using those, seeing as how the dots reflect off and are are, are you know absorbed by the material to figure out where it is. LiDAR works really well for longer distances. Now this thing has got spatial recognition to about you know, three meters, something like that. You probably don't need that much because if you're going faster than three meters wearing this thing, I'm not, sure I, I'm not sure I'd do that. The reason why they do it on the, the cars and all the chips like that is because they're trying to look further out to kind of get that level of understanding about you know, cars coming in or, 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 or banks or things like that. Whereas for a human wearable device, you can deal with a little smaller uh, of a scale. And lower power devices can work pretty well. It depends. It, it, it's all a trade. You know, the different sensors, the LiDAR versus structured light versus this, it's all trading battery life versus distance versus accuracy versus 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 versus. There's so many things which kind of go into what the right sensor choice is for the headset you need. And then, okay. So, last thing um, AR is the next wave of computing. It's not too far away. Um, there's lots of money going into that uh, area. The headsets are getting better all the time. I think the there's so many complicated things going into them that it's almost as complicated. It's probably more complicated than doing the first mobile phone. So it's, you know, whenever someone says, I've got this brand new technology, which will beat everybody, yeah, don't believe the hype. You know, it'll, it takes, it's going to take a lot of money, a lot of time to actually make a usable full device. Um, AR and, and uh, VR-enabled stuff will have plenty of new ways to interact with 3D, 3D data sets. Uh, how you're doing all this stuff together is going to provide a whole new way to interact with things. Um, this stuff is hard. Dude, putting everything in 3D is, is a whole, literally a whole other dimension compared to 2D. You've got to really kind of work that into what it, all the development that you do. And um, we, of course, can help with that. So for all your AR projects, you know who to come to. <laughs> That's it.